Um, so we are going to cover the very, very basics of the research ecosystem, because if I did everything, we'd probably be here at the end of the week still and still not have covered everything. So this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and a lot of acronyms as well. Yeah. NIHR, other research funders love an acronym. So if I end up talking in acronyms, I apologize. I would try and explain everything in full when I first use it. At the end of my slides, I have got a glossary and links to various things, which I won't talk through, but they're in your pack. So you can go and find them in your own time. So um, hopefully I won't talk in too many acronyms. Apologies in advance. So. What do we mean by research ecosystem? It kind of means different things, different people. But at the end of the day, we all want to deliver high quality research that's going to be a benefit to patients. Um, and to do that, we need the, all the bits of the ecosystem to come together so that we can deliver that research. Uh, so what does it, you know, who does it include? It includes health and care professionals. It includes researchers, regulators, funders, research support services, infrastructure, and most importantly, participants who take part in our research for us as well. So uh, a bit of context, you know, wh where does the context for the world we work in come from? And this is just a list of in, you know, important documents and white papers that are published over the years. Um, and it kind of sets the framework for the way which health and care research operates across uh, England and the rest of the United Kingdom as well. Uh, so picked out some most important ones here. So of course, good clinical practice, everything we do has to comply to good clinical practice. That sets out you know, key criteria for the way we do research. Um, the UK policy for um, uh, health and social care research published in 2020, it's a fairly updated document, really important to have a quick look at that. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of them in lots of detail. If you're applying to NIHR, one of the most important documents you can look at is the best research of best health, the next chapter. So it's updated in 2021. The original version was published in 2006. Have a quick look at that. And um, it lists um, all, all the sort of key areas of research for NIHR over the coming years. Um, and then another really important document is the NHS five year forward uh, plan. So long term plan published in 2019. And again, that lists the key priorities research going forward over, uh, over the next uh, five years or so. So really important document, set the context and the way we work, quite dry. But if you can just read the uh, you know, executive summary or go and you know, scroll through and pick out the, the bits that are most relevant to you. Here's a list of some of the many organisations and their acronyms you know, that are available to us doing research. These organisations are there to support you know, everyone who does research. So it's really important trying to understand a little bit about what's out there and go and talk to people and just see what's available and see if you can work with them and can use their resources. You know, don't invent stuff from scratch. You know, use what's out there already. So um, I will talk very briefly about some of these, not about all of them. <laughs> So uh, just uh, my point was that you're not alone, not hearing everything, you know, it's it's so difficult to, to keep track of everything that's out there. So brief top level. So research design service. Yay, that's us. You know, come and talk to us if you've got an idea and you want to do research. Um, we are a very friendly group of people and we really want to try and help people do good quality research. So at the earliest opportunity, come and talk to your research design service. So as soon as you've got an idea, come and have a chat. We're really happy to speak to you. Uh, speak to your local R&D offices at uh, trusts, universities. They're a really good source of information. Uh, clinical research networks, CRNs. So if you're recruiting patients into studies, contact the CRN. They are disease-based. Normally there are some, some more general ones as well, but they, they have all the skills, the expertise in recruiting patients into studies, and they are there to help you. Uh, CTUs, clinical trials units. If you're running a clinical trial, you need to have, or more often than not, you need to have a CTU on board in that study. So speak to your CTU. There's one in Southampton, there's several in Oxford. Um, uh, you don't have to use the one local to you. Some CTUs have expertise in particular areas. Go to that CTU. Um, NIHR um, 
when there's a call which is slightly outside of where NIHR normally works. So a recent example of that is there's a social care call currently open, looking at moving uh, technologies into use in social care settings. We know that the social care world is not as developed as that of the medical world, and we really want to get more social care work up and running. So in calls like that, we are listing CTUs that have got expertise in social care so that we can just try and help people start those first conversations. So. Um, if you're not sure, uh, you can normally e email CTUs and they would tell you where their expertise lies. The website might give you a point as well. Uh, so technology transfer offices, TTOs, uh, anything to do with IP, they are like your, your font of knowledge going towards your technology transfer. So they, they get all that IP stuff, the who owns the foreground IP, the background IP, and they can help you with all of that. So if you're working with a small and medium enterprise, they are the place to go. And I think I've got a link on my last slides, where to find them. So um, I hope I've covered all of them. Um, the MHRA, so Medical and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, you need to be involved with them if you're doing a, a, a CTIM trial, basically. Um, they, they handle all the reg regulation. Uh, MedTech and in vitro diagnostic cooperative mix used to be called DEX. Uh, so if you're doing anything to do with MedTech or diagnostics, there are, I can't remember how many centers there are now across um, England, I think they're only England based. Um, they generally have areas which they work on. So you don't have to go and work with the one nearest to you. You can go, you know, choose one that's got expertise in the area you want to work in. Uh, academic health science networks, these again are these are regionally based, go and speak to your local one, really good at supporting getting uh, studies up and running. ARCs, so the applied research collaborations and the biomedical research centers, BRCs. They are locally based, but generally have different sort of themes they operate in. And again, these two have sort of small pots of money. So you want a little bit of money just to do a little bit of research to get, to build you up to do that larger piece of research. These might have money which you can apply to to do that small bit of research. So well worth making contact with your, your local or relevant ARCs and BRCs if they're relevant to the work you're doing. So... I was going to talk roughly through kind of how you go from having a research idea and what different groups you want to speak to at different stages to try and sort of guide where these groups are most uh, helpful. So you've got an idea for research. Fantastic. Um, it, at that point in time, it's really great just going to talk to your colleagues. Make sure you're not the only person who feels this is a gap in evidence. Uh, also talk to patients. You know, it might be a great idea, but if patients aren't interested and aren't going to sign up for that research, it's not going to fly. So it's so important early on to get that patient perspective as well. Um, it might be then worth looking nationally. So I don't know how many people heard of the James Lind Alliance, the JLA. Uh, so it's an organisation which brings... Uh, clinicians and patients together to prioritise where the top 10 uncertainties are in different areas. So, for example, end-of-life care, I know, is currently being refreshed at the moment. And they, they uh, come together from a wide range of backgrounds, and then they prioritise the top 10 uncertainties. There will be more as well, which are also important. And try and fit your research ideas into one of them, because that, that shows there's a real national need for the work that's going on. It doesn't have to be JLA. It could be... Um, you know, other professional bodies do prioritization exercises. You know, does your idea fit into what other national people are calling for? So it's just nice to have that sort of broader support outside of your own thinking and outside your own local area. Uh, talk to the RDS at that point. You know, they were the RDS are great at being able to sort of help through that thinking, you know, help draw out what the research question is. You know, what is your primary research question and what are more secondary questions? Um, and then at that point, you know, they can start to talk about, you know, this is a funder you want to aim for, or that's a funder you want to aim for, just so you can start then to go and think about how you might frame your, your research a little bit, you know, to meet the needs of that funder. I would then go and talk to the various bits of the infrastructure that are there to help you. So the mix, if you're doing diagnostics, if you're doing some sort of experimental medicine type um, piece of work, the BRCs, CRS, that's the clinical research facilities <laughs> um, and then the TRC's translational research cooperatives which are again uh, nationally based and they are just groups of people prioritizing idea, uh, ideas in certain areas. If you're working with an SME talk to NOCRI. NOCRI stands for the N stands for NIHR and office 
of clinical research infrastructure. And their, their main role is to facilitate that work in between SMEs and uh, the research community. And they also have a matchmaking service. So they can match make SMEs to um, people working you know, on the field in there. So that they are a real source of knowledge if you're working with SMEs. Um, if you're working in applied research, contact the ARC. And then we've done all of that, start thinking about your research funder, talk to your funder, your know, funders are approachable. You know, I have worked at NIHR for a long time. I love it when I talk to people um, and you can give people a steer really early on uh, about you know, whether their idea is likely to fit with what you know, that, that particular you know, funder's looking for. And if it doesn't, you can try and point them to a different bit so that they don't waste their own time and also the funder's time. You know? So it's, it's really beneficial for everyone to talk to the funder as early as you possibly can. So uh, then once you've got this idea, you know, you can apply to, you've got to write the application. And it makes it sound really simple. One line, just write your proposal. We know it's not that simple. It takes a lot of work, doesn't it? But um, uh, use the RDS, use you know, anything out there to help you. So use the contacts you make in the research infrastructure to help you write that application. You know, people have done it before. Um, grantmanship is so important when you're writing a, a grant application, you know, writing in a way which, you know, funders are going to like it. And people who have done that before are really helpful in helping you get that right to spin in the way that you write it. Uh, speak to a CTU if you need to. Not every study needs one, but if you are doing a clinical trial, really important you contact them early. Uh, nearly every piece of research needs a sponsor. So the sponsor is the uh, the... the the organization or the partnership that takes overall responsibility for that study and therefore takes uh, responsibility for any patients involved in that research. Uh, it's normally NHS Trust, uh, university, but talk to your R&D office. They will be really helpful in you know, helping you identify who the most appropriate sponsor is. Um, and then talk to the finance office for that sponsor. You know, universities have very complicated you know finance systems you need to include all of that in, in the grant application when you get there so talk to them early and they will talk to you about how how you you know use costings appropriately and how you attribute this cost to research costs or that that cost there is you know excess treatment cost and they are they know all of that so talk to them really early on uh, identify other sites early on so that's so important about collaboration so talking to your colleagues you should be able to identify, identify sites who want to be working as well who'd be interested in being involved um if you've got ip involved talk to the technology transfer office at this point um early contact the crn is really helpful so that's a clinical research network so we're going to recruit patients talk to them early get them on board um you know get to know what they, they what they'd be looking for from you and at what stages start that relationship really early Talk to any regulator if that's appropriate as well at this stage. So once you've done that, let's assume you get through all the hurdles of funding. I'm not going to talk about the hurdles of applying for funding right now. They are numerous. And again, we could be here for several days, couldn't we? So um, let's assume we make it through all the hurdles of applying for funding. Follow their guidelines. Most simple piece of advice I can give you. Whatever the funder says, do. Um, and then... You need to think about everything you need to put in place once you've got that funding. So you will get a, a letter from the funder saying you have been funded, nearly always changes to make. Um, and then, but while you're making those changes, you can start to think about the other things you might need. So uh, start to apply for any ethics you might need. That might be both your local university ethics, also that HRA approval um, through the IRAS system as well. Uh, Sort out if you need any research passports, so that's for you know, university staff to be able to carry out work in the NHS, sort that out now. Um, work with the funder on the changes and really now start talk to the CRN if you need to recruit, recruit patients, get them thinking about your study now, get them starting to identify patients early on. So speaking to them, so important, so early. Um, so this is a very brief sort of rundown of kind of what you need to consider probably you know, all research in the NHS needs a sponsor and it needs R&D approval. So we've talked about that, get them done early, go make contacts, talk to people. Uh, most research require funding. That could be a big project funding from one of the NIHR programmes or from one of the research councils. It could be smaller bits of money from uh, the ARCs or something like that. Uh, you would need ethics approval as well for your involving participants. Uh, and then any other approvals that you might require can be done alongside those as well. 
So this was a slide just to try and bring it all together. Um, I, I talked for it very, very briefly. So you know, outside you know, the first sort of preparing the project, talk to the RDS. We can't flag that enough today. You know, talk to the RDS. We're here to help. Um, and then as you start to write a proposal, these are the things you can start to do alongside. You know, talk to your clinical trials unit, talk to the technology transfer office, um, talk to the CRN, start to talk about sites to them, and then finding sponsors, agreeing with sponsors, um, start to do costings. You know, all there. And then once you apply for research funding, you can do your ethics and stuff afterwards. So this is just try to bring it all together, uh, try to um, list out, you know, what what um, all the acronyms mean. Um, so I won't talk to that side in a lot of detail. Like I said, glossary links to where you can find things online. And that's all my slides, I think, isn't it? Thank you very much.